Welcome everybody, thanks for coming along. Uh, I hope it's going to be a fun day, uh, hopefully an interesting day, an exciting day. Um, I want to start, first of all, by... Um, have you all, do you all know mapping our ancestors? It's like mapping our ancestors. Have you ever have a look at it? Sometimes. Let's just have a little quick look because I want to tell you something about it. Okay, mapping our ancestors is a site I worked on at the National Archives of Australia. Uh, and what it does is it takes the 370 odd thousand World War One service records, which are held by the National Archives of Australia, that's the World War One service records, um, and it geocodes them. What's geocoding? Geocoding is a process where you locate something on a map, basically. You find its latitude and longitude. In this case, what we did was we took the places of birth and enlistment of those uh, World War One service people and we put them on a map. We found their coordinates and we put them on a map. And you can actually just um, dive into mapping our Anzacs um, and you get these little flags. You can go through those flags and you get a list of names of people associated with those places and you can go through and find more information about those people. Now, mapping our Anzacs is, is, uh, is quite nice, but um, there's a, a, a bit of a disappointment really for me uh, in, de in developing it. And that was that we can't show all the places at once. Um, we had to actually design it in a way that it wouldn't blow up people's web browsers. Uh, and if we tried to show all the places, which are like 10,000 or more places, that's what would have happened. So we had to sort of compromise and put little clusters of flags there. So you only see a few at a time, and as you sort of click on one of the blue flags, it opens up and you see more of the other flags. And I want to show you a different perspective today. I want to show you what happens when we do try to look at them all at once. Uh, and this is using uh, Google Earth uh, and a, a data file drawn from mapping our ANZACs in a format called KML, which you don't need to worry about. Mm. Now, I don't know there's much I need to say about this. Um, <laughs> as you zoom in, you just see more and more of those place names resolved, more and more of those markers appear. Um, it's actually very powerful, I think, um, and it really um, gives you a sense that no place was left untouched. That every town, every community, every street, every home, every family was touched in some way. Um, and it was that uh, sense that we wanted to get across with mapping our index originally, the sense that you know, it's all about what's happening in these towns. Um, to, to forget about the sort of the, the national mythology for a moment and actually look at what's happening in those places and to give those records back, those World War service, one service records back to the places. That was what we were hoping to do with mapping our insects. And indeed, I'll let you into another secret. Um, the, the name that the development team wanted to use for this resource was in fact local heroes. Um, but we got overruled by those above us. Uh, and we ended up with mapping our ANZACs. <coughs> now, another exciting aspect um, of working on, on mapping our ANZACs was the uh, scrapbook element. Uh, there is, in fact, people can go find a World War One service record and then add material to it, um, anything they want, basically photographs, stories, or whatever. Uh, and they have done so in vast numbers, uh, many, many thousands of contributions to the scrapbook. Um, and you can start to just have a, this is the material that people have been adding to the World War I service record. So photographs, notes, stories, and the, oh, I forgot to start my timer, I always do that. Okay. And, the, uh, and the thing which was, was most exciting, most gratifying about this was people started to use this in ways we never expected. Um, so some people would just say, this was my granddad, you know, thanks, we miss you. Some people will write quite detailed biographies. Uh, there's somebody who's been going around um, documenting uh, memorial parks and gravestones <coughs> and has been linking them to the World War I service records. Uh, so it's quite fascinating to see the uses that people put to this and the way they give it meaning. Uh, so they really made it their own, and that, that really is you know, an almost and exciting part of the whole project to me. Um, but I want to actually just share with you one particular fragment.
Okay, this is within the scrapbook. It was uh, attached to the service record of Alexander Cunning. As you can see, it's a fragment from a diary which was found in a family Bible. Uh, and you can read it there. Alex arrived from France wet day, sorting a cornfield. Obviously, this was a you know, very significant day in the life of that family. Um, but we can also read some more into that little diary fragment. You'll see that Caulfield, which of course is a suburb of Melbourne, but in this case it's enclosed in inverted commas. Uh, and I think that's because the Caulfield in this case was the Caulfield Hospital. <coughs> the Alexander Kelly, who returned from the war, was not the same young man who went away to war. He was blinded in both eyes, um, and one of his legs had been amputated. He spent the rest of his life in a hostel in Brighton. So, Um, you can see the sort of depth of meaning you can get by encouraging people to contribute this material and how it adds to the archival record. Now, I do quite a few talks about the sort of significance and meaning of digital history and the possibilities of digital history, and often I talk about um, the way it helps us grapple with abundance, deal with the voluminous sources which are becoming available online. You know, how do we make sense of all this material which is becoming available, and how do we use it? But there's actually another really exciting and important aspect of digital history um, where there's some real potential and real power and that is its ability to connect um, connect big pictures to individual stories to work from a map of the world to drill right down and find something that is as small and as fragile and yet as devastating as this diary fragment to make those connections to be able to zoom in and out I think this is a really exciting opportunity in terms of digital history. Because what happens then? What happens when you have that ability to make those links between these individual fragments, these small stories and these big pictures? Well, the big picture, of course, gets a lot more depth and meaning and emotion. And the fragments themselves gain context. They gain connections. We can explore them as a whole rather than just the individual elements. I think there is really immense power and potential in the technologies that we have to do this sort of work, to make these sort of connections, and to give us new ways of thinking about and feeling about and using these sources. And that's why this is such an exciting opportunity, and that's why I'm so grateful to be here and part of this project. What is the Doing Our Bit project? Well, um, <coughs> it's, about <coughs> it's about collecting information on local service people people who are associated with Mossman. Um, and we will be developing a website which will enable people to easily contribute uh, information, photographs, documents, stories, whatever they want to about those uh, local service people. But we'll also be linking it out. <coughs> so it won't be a standalone resource, it'll be linking out to other resources relating to those people uh, wherever they may be. So in various archival collections, uh, in other uh, World War One projects, we'll be trying to find those bigger contexts as well as telling those small stories. So what we're going to end up is end up with is much more than just a list of names, much more than just a collection. It's going to be a way of really exploring the meaning of World War One uh, at a local level, as it was experienced in Mosman. Doing what we sort of hoped to do originally with mapping our Anzacs in actually situating that at a local level and understanding what was going on in people's lives at that time. So, I'm so glad you're all here and that we can make a start on this today. Um, and there'll be some, it's going to be some really exciting opportunities, not just today, but for the next month, few months as we start to develop this project. And, of course, any uh, internet presentation nowadays has to have a picture of a cat. <laughs> um, so, I thought we would keep up that standard. Um, as you can see, this is a cat from the collection of the Australian War Memorial. Uh, it's a mascot. Uh, and uh, it was a mascot which was uh, given by uh, the mother of uh, Captain Taylor there, who was born in Mossman. Um, he became quite a distinguished pilot. And interestingly, he served at the Royal Flying Corps um, rather than the, uh, the, the local flying corps. Um, so we've got to remember too that people didn't, uh, who were associated with Mossman didn't necessarily just serve in the Australian Armed Forces. Um, as I say, he was quite a distinguished pilot. He flew with Kingston Smith. Uh, he flew with Charles Orr, who 
was also head of the Muslim connection. Um, and uh, he was eventually knighted. Uh, and in fact, we can even find out more about him because he's in the Australian Dictionary of Biography. So, that's just a little glimpse of the sorts of materials and resources and connections that are out there that we can start to make and pull together and tell these quite detailed and rich stories. Um, and uh, we've got chocolate. We have chocolate. We have prizes. Uh, sort of spot prizes throughout the day. If anybody can find any more cats uh, associated with Mossman and World War One, that's definitely a candidate for some chocolate. Um, and uh, what we're going to do now is start to think about and talk about uh, what we're actually going to do during the day. Uh, as I said, this is a starting point. This is a day to actually start uh, uh, developing the project, doing some work, um, and we have a program. Where is that program? Okay. <coughs> now, I've been posting a few sort of ideas of things that we might do today on, on the blog, um, and in, I mean, I perhaps goes without saying, please keep an eye on the blog. Uh, over the next few months as we start to do more and develop more and we'll be seeking feedback. It's not just about today, it's about starting a process which is going to be continuing. Um, but today, uh, we want to uh, think about, uh, start doing a bit of work, start doing some tasks. What they are, are up to you, what you want to do. Um, there is, as I said, there's a few things on the blog. For example, we, uh, there's a post there which talks about uh, looking within the Trove newspaper database, of course. Do we all love the Trove newspaper database? Yes. <laughs> um, okay, and of course this is going to be a, a fantastic resource, um, both for finding uh, information about uh, specific individuals, but also uh, because it actually gives us this little wealth of contextual information about what's actually going on at the time uh, within this area. Um, now, the aim today is not necessarily just to uh, you know, uh, find a whole lot of stuff, make a whole lot of connections. It's also to think about the processes that are involved here. As I say, this is going to be an ongoing project. Um, and um, I'm hoping that by actually starting to work with a bit of data today, by doing a bit of searching, to do a bit of playing around, we can start to find some material, but also start to identify where issues, problems, questions may be. So as you're sort of starting to look at stuff and, and, and work with material today, I also want you to think about the process that you're going through, uh, where you're seeing um, opportunities, uh, where you're seeing potential problems, where you, you know, see there's uh, some possibilities for connecting material up. Um, you know, it is about documenting the, the process that we're going through today as well as about actually just achieving something in terms of, of, of collecting material. Um, I also... Uh, so, so in the case of Trove, for example, um, it's uh, you know part of what we've got to do is think strategically about what we're searching for, uh, and, and document that process so that we know what we've looked for, uh, and, and we, we can uh, repeat those processes as necessary. See what's going on. So you might like to start doing some searches within Trove, seeing what's worked, seeing what they bring back, the sort of articles that they bring back, the sorts of information that those articles contain. Oh, sorry. Um, I, I know that this is George. Thank you, everybody. You've been working on that, but, uh, and certainly we're working from. Uh, uh, and George has uh, produced uh, a, a record of the people who are um, names are on the uh, the Moss Memorial Memorial, um, and. Um, and that's certainly uh, uh, one of our important starting points. Um, and we'll be, uh, but what we've got to do is actually sort of link out from that and find other material as well. Well, at some stage, I think that I should speak to Okay, okay, sure. Do you want to add anything? Um, I'm George Frankie. I lived in Mossman from 1962 to 1992. And, uh, I'm a member of the Mossman RSL and a member of the Belmont Beach Club. And uh, I've written a, a booklet which lists all the names of the dead that I could find on the War Memorial here and using
interesting other sources I found another 134 um, so I've discovered about 335 names of Muslim people who died um, I was able to locate the Muslim people through a database called the AIF project in which you can search by suburb and I found about <coughs> 1500 Muslim names of people who enlisted from Muslim and then I, I went through and I found the 334 dead. Um, well it's a, a terrible story the, the list of streets in Mosman is just incredible. Alexander, Almora, Aurora, Belmoral, Calypso, Glover, McLeod, Melaleuca, Wants, Baringa Road, it just goes on and on. And there were 18 sets of brothers killed. Um, that's about all, all, the, all that I I wish to say at this stage. Thanks, George. <coughs> so, um, yeah, so we're, we're, we're dealing with, uh, as George said, I mean, he's identified a lot of the, the, the Muslim people who have been killed during the war. Um, we're also uh, interested in those people who served but were not uh, killed during the war. Um, uh, and the AI database is certainly one source of that material. Um, and um, but what we I'll go back to what we want to do is actually find the uh, look through these various databases which are available <coughs> um, not just to find the details but to also find the references within those databases because remember part of the project here part of the aim is actually to draw together the resources wherever they might be um, to enable us to have those things so that we can use the, the MOS material as a way of getting into these various archival collections which are available. So there are a number of resources there. Uh, there's the Royal One Service Records, um, which can be searched by name through uh, the Record Search database or through uh, Place by Mac and Anzacs. There's about 80 people uh, who are listed as born in Mossman within Mac and Anzacs. Um, there's the role of honour database at the Australian War Memorial, the nominal role and the embarkation roles at the Australian War Memorial as well, the Red Cross wounded and missing files, um, which are a, a fascinating resource. I know George has produced those as well, um, because they actually document that we, if people had inquiries about what happened to somebody, oh. the, the, the Red Cross uh, would, would uh, investigate, uh, and there were some amazing sort of uh, exchanges of correspondence um, and, and documents relating to those people. Uh, and there's also the Commonwealth War Graves database, um, and that uh, records where people are buried. Um, uh, and uh, it's also useful uh, having a Commonwealth perspective, as again, for picking up those people who may be associated with Mossman but who didn't actually serve in the Australian Armed Forces. Um, and there are a number of those. If you go there, it, uh, it, uh, it doesn't have sort of full uh, information about the people, but it has, for example, the addresses of the next of kin. So if you search on Mossman, you pull up the addresses of the, the parents of, of people, uh, the, the parents who are living in Mossman, and so you can then find those connections there. So, uh, again, it's a matter of looking at the processes involved here, working with what we've got, working with the, what we've, uh, George has already provided with us, with us, us with. <coughs> Uh, and uh, looking at how we can go further in terms of finding the links in these various databases and pulling it together. Um, looking at what the sorts of information which is it, uh, available in each of those databases and how we're going to extract and use that. And again, you know, talking about the processes involved here and not just the endpoints. Um, <coughs> other possibilities uh, for, for uh, things that you might like to think about today. We're building a website. Websites have interfaces. What's it going to look like? How are we going to use it? Who are going to use it? What are the sort of audiences that may be using this material and what might they expect? How might, what, they might, what might they expect to find? Um, I'd be interested if people have perspectives on that and want to talk about that sort of thing as well. Um, there's uh, one sort of really interesting, exciting aspect of all of this, of course, is 
um, the dimensions of time and space and how we use those and how we explore those in a project such as this. Um, if we think about space for a moment um, and how we can locate these people, um, we can of course, uh, you know, if we have uh, address information and the World War One service records do tend to have address information, um, we can locate them within Mossman. Um, uh, <coughs> Mapping our assets at the moment, people are just geolocated to the level of the suburb, is that right? That's not right. the actual street. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <coughs> so we have opportunities here for producing such more, something which is much more fine grained than the, the local level. Um, uh, how then do we represent that though? You know, everybody just chucks everything up on a Google map. Um, and, um, you know, if thinking historically, that might not be the best approach. If we can use a historic maps, for example, uh, as, a, as a base layer for a, for a map and put our markers on top of that, it could produce something which is much more useful in terms of visualising the historical experience and understanding the historical experience. When we're also thinking about place, of course, we're also talking about where they went and what they did. Um, so we have you know, you know, the battlefields of Europe, uh, the various staging points that they, they went through. This sort of material is actually uh, tends to be recorded again within their World War One service records. Um, we have information on embarkation from the, the War Memorial records. Um, we have information about where their graves are if they died, of course, through the Commonwealth War Graves. Um, so we have a range of spatial information which we can start to use and collate and represent. Uh, but there are issues involved in all of that, um, and that's the sorts of thing we can start thinking about how we might want to use it, how we link it up, where the issues are going to be, where the problems are going to be. The, um, <coughs> um, uh, there's also the, the bigger context of all this material, of course, uh, and there are other projects going on to start to document some of this sort of material in, in regards to World War I, um, and we can start to uh, link in with that as well. Um, and there's already information out there, for example. I mean, if we're talking about battles, involving in battles, trying to uh, uh, map those on a timeline uh, for the individual experience of a person, there's information in things like Wikipedia, for example, um, that we can draw on and link to, which gives the context of that, that battle uh, in terms of their uh, membership within a particular unit of the armed forces. Uh, there will be contextual information about those units from the Australian War Memorial again. So there's those sorts of contextual links which we can start to make. Mm. Um, <coughs> in regards to, uh, again, the, the uh, uh, World War I service records, I mean, it is actually a rich resource in a number of ways. Uh, and one is that it does tend to show the, the uh, uh, not the day-to-day -day experience, but the, the major events in that individual person's war experience. So their movements, <coughs> their involvement uh, with having I mean, wounded, injured or whatever. So lots of information that we might sort of think about in terms of mapping them on, on, over time, their experience over time and place. So one question which I have, or one sort of task which, you know, if somebody wants to have a look at it, is starting to think about how we model uh, that documentation within those files. How we think about uh, events. Events are something which always seem really simple until you start to try and sort of capture them in a structured way. Um, because dates are never quite as clear cut as you think they're going to be, uh, and labels are always a bit fuzzy. So, um, a task somebody could do is actually start to look in detail at some World War I service records, look at the material that's in them in terms of the documentation of their war experience, and think about how we might capture that uh, and then be able to use that in, in, in a structured way, in a, in a way which enables us to, again, visualise that experience. Um, now, there's material, of course, locally, held within the local studies collection, and Donna might like to say something about some of the material that's here. Um, I know that there's sort of local community groups, the, uh, the Rifle Club, for example, which is uh, um, going to be having its centenary in 1950. <coughs> Obviously, that's very much associated with the, the, the war effort, uh, and uh, that sort of documentation which is developed for that would also feed into the <coughs> opportunities there as well. Um, at this point, I want to sort of hand it over to you, to anybody, if anybody's got any suggestions about the sorts of things they're interested in exploring and how they might want to explore it. 
Uh, if you've got something you want to start on, you know, please uh, put up your hand and say what it is. Um, the idea is we've got a few different rooms, we've got some different spaces so that people can get together and work on individual things.